having an out of body experience and seeing what my husband was scrolling. He was looking for like a backpack or something. He was like on Amazon or something scrolling. And I, and I remember seeing it, but I was asleep, like looking, seeing what he was doing and, and then waking up and were you just looking at back? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Today's guest, Natalie Dyer, PhD is a research scientist with Connor Whole Health at University Hospitals, Susan Simwelli Integrative Health Institute at University of California, Irvine, and president of the Center for Reiki Research. Um, when I was at Queen's University, which is in Canada, everyone was like, except for my advisor, she was amazing, but pretty much everyone else was like, oh, you should just be a yoga teacher, not a researcher. I was like, oh, okay. And then, and then I... Isn't that terrible? Then I go to Harvard, like Harvard, right? And they're all like, oh, Reiki. Yeah, I love Reiki. And so, so I went. obtained her Bachelor of Science degree at the University of Toronto, Doctorate in Neuroscience at Queen's University, and postdoctoral fellowships at Harvard University and Harvard Medical School. And so the people slept maybe eight hours and they thought they slept five hours. Or they slept five hours and they thought they slept eight hours. And then they did all kinds of tests like reaction time, cognitive tests, looked at their EEG, their self-reported sleepiness and all of this. And we found that their reaction time, their cognitive function, how sleepy they were and their EEG activity all followed perceived time. So if they thought they only slept five hours, but they slept eight hours, you'd think they'd well rested. But they're doing these tasks as if they're sleep deprived just thinking that they slept five hours. Hi, today I am talking with Natalie Dyer. So why don't you introduce yourself and let everyone know a bit about who you are. Okay. Uh, well, hi, Liz. I'm happy to be here. Hi. Happy to hi. have you. <laughs> um, I call myself a research scientist. Um, my background is in neuroscience specifically, but I do a lot of um, psychology research now. So I just kind of settled in the term of research scientist. Um, my PhD, as I said, is in neuroscience. Um, I'm also a Reiki master. I'm sure we're going to be talking a lot about Reiki today. So that's a biofield therapy. And I study Reiki as well as part of my role as a research scientist. So I currently am working with Connor Whole Health at University Hospitals in Ohio. I live in Canada, so I work remotely. Um, so I look at patient reported outcomes following all kinds of different integrative medicine modalities. So from acupuncture, massage, yoga, um, and Reiki as well. So within the hospital setting, which is pretty awesome that we're at that point where it's being offered to patients. And I have a practice as a Reiki master. And uh, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Sums well, it up. It's, I just have to ask because not that many neuroscientists or kind of science traditional science minded people in general, at least at this point, get that much into this research. So what got you into all of this in the first place? Yeah, well, um, it's, it's kind of a journey from being really little and, and um, just having this sense that there was more to life than this natural sense, like there's more going on than I can see. Um, I knew about, you know, waves and different energies. You can't see them all the time, right? So there's a lot of reality that we don't perceive. And I just um, got really into that and, and into science and truth. Um, so I was very much into finding out truth of existence for whatever reason, just an interest of mine um, and interested in biology and animal life and, and life and the mind and just a lot of interest in, um, I guess, overall life and psychology. And having these experiences at a young age, too, so out-of-body experiences, flying through my room as a child, down the stairs, you know, seeing what my parents were doing, that kind of stuff. And then some intuitive dreams, simple, silly things I've mentioned on other podcasts, like dreaming that my mom bought two bunches of grapes. And she was at the grocery store, apparently, while I was still sleeping. And I'm like, two bunches of grapes? So oh, that's weird. And I wake up, and she's stocking the fridge, and she was like, Grapes were on sale. I got two bunches of grapes. And she'd never done that before. So just little silly things like that where I'm like, oh, like I'm tuning into some, there's something going on. Um, so I kind of kept an interest in that, but then got really big into the science because I thought this is truth, science. Um, and then in university, all of the things that I had experienced were termed pseudoscience. And 
I thought, oh, that's kind of disappointing. <laughs> I didn't necessarily believe that that was the case, but part of me was kind of like compartmentalizing these two aspects now where I even went through a little period of, I guess what you could call atheism or agnosticism makes more sense really, um, where I thought I needed you know, a certain amount of proof. I am still very evidence-based in my mindset, but um, yeah, I went through a little period there. Um, and then just kept having these experiences and then realizing, well, if you study something scientifically, it's not pseudoscience. So that's just wrong. And then coming upon this materialist, scientific materialist paradigm um, and seeing how ridiculous people were when you couldn't even talk about these things with some of your colleagues and things like that. Since then, so I'm talking maybe 2008 to 2012-ish, there's been a big change where a lot of people I work with are open to this stuff now. So just in, the, in that decade and a bit, there's been a really big shift that I've noticed. Um, so yeah, I just started shifting my research from what was a pharmacological approach, materialist, brain circuitry, what's going on. Um, I looked at animal models of anxiety. So what goes on when an animal or a human, you know, as an analog, has a threat in the environment, what brain regions are involved, what neurochemistry is involved, and what does that do to execute certain behaviors. But during that time, I got into a friend dragged me to yoga class and took my first like real yoga class. And it was a big shift for me. And then I got into meditation and then Reiki kind of tailed on with that. And, and I found these practices that were like adapted from the East or Eastern practices that I felt were really getting at something in a, in a deep way beyond just like mental constructs of spirituality. And of course I had these experiences but like a spiritual practice that really created uh, different states of consciousness in me. So that was a huge shift. And I decided, okay, my research has to, I can't do animal model research anymore. I can't, I became vegan and all this stuff. I'm not vegan anymore, but you know, I had a huge shift in consciousness. And then um, for my postdoc work, went to Harvard and started doing some mindfulness research, some yoga research and some Reiki research. So I'm still in that today. And have successfully, I guess, merged those two <laughs> sides of myself. Okay, so I am going to have so many questions about your out-of-body experiences, but I first want to ask you, what exactly is Reiki? I mean, some listeners might not have really heard of it. Yeah, it's uh, so it's two words. It's, it's a Japanese tradition of biofield therapy, and it loosely translates to universal life force energy or guided universal life force energy. And it's about 100 years old um, from Japan, but it's based on an older practice. Some say it's rediscovered from Tibet or, you know, there's a lot of debate about the true history of Reiki, but it's a biofield therapy, which means that it's working with the energy systems of the body to modify health and well-being at that more fundamental level. And so it works with what you can call laying on of the hands. So a practitioner that's similar to Qigong there's a, or pranic healing or therapeutic touch or healing touch. There's a lot of different practices that work on the practitioner gets into a meditative state of some kind where they're very present. You're not in your ego mind as much. So you're not thinking about like maybe your grocery list or, you know, any, any of your hangups or anything like that. You're just present and open your heart and allow this energy to flow through you into um, the client or patient or whoever you're working with or yourself. So it's based on this idea that there's universal life force energy, spirit, prana, chi, all these different names for it, that we can tap into it because we're alive and that's what we're made of. And, and it's constantly flowing through us. And we use our intention and our focus to bring that in and send it to another person. And the idea is that an imbalance in that energy leads to disease and illness eventually. So it might start off as a mental thing. It might end up being a physical health issue eventually. Um, and so we work to restore that balance at the root so that we can maintain health. And it's about eliciting the body's natural healing process. So rather than, you know, I don't know what the difference would be, but you're really working with the person's own energy to, to, bring them back into a homeostatic state. 
that's so interesting. Um, yeah, I want to ask you, though, you said that a lot of the people you used to work with who were really close to this, that I guess that I'm assuming that's traditional researchers and neuroscientists, that they've become really open to this now. What what has caused the shift, do you think? Um, I'm not sure exactly, but I think... <clears throat> So it's interesting because very early on it was like meditation was pseudoscience. And that's it seems ridiculous now because there's so much mindfulness research, hundreds of thousands of studies probably at this point. Um, and then that explosion, I think, just hit the mainstream in a lot of ways. So mindfulness, a lot of people know what it is now. It's I think it's really hard to find someone that's never even heard of mindfulness. And if you just say, oh, it's paying attention in the present moment, it's a pretty simple thing to explain. Um, so that boom in research shifted the perception around meditation, like, oh, okay, it can help. It's, they're being used in business to increase productivity and all these kinds of boring uses, <laughs> I would consider. Um, and then that made a shift in yoga as well. And yoga is a little more spiritual, maybe a little more woo woo to some people than mindfulness. And, and then tail ending on that is there's a lot of more research in Reiki and biofield therapy. So I think the door has been kind of opening up a little bit more to other practices that are somewhat related. The internet, I think, has helped, surely. Um, you can look this stuff up very easily, find tons of information on it before, you know, we're dealing locally in our towns. And um, but now you can see, you know, all kinds of podcasts and interviews and documentaries about all of this stuff. And and I think the psychedelic stuff that's coming up um, is also kind of all interwoven with that. So there is a global shift going on um, where people are becoming more accepted of it, acceptable um, to these practices. But I don't know exactly why. I mean, some people say that this shift is meant to happen. It's a shift in consciousness and um, that, yeah, but who knows why. But I think as we do more research and as it becomes more mainstream, then it just naturally shifts culture. So um, when I was at Queens University, which is in Canada, everyone was like, except for my advisor, she was amazing, but pretty much everyone else was like, oh, you should just be a yoga teacher, not a researcher. It's like, oh, okay. Oh, and then, no, that's and then so I, close. Isn't that terrible? Then I go to Harvard, like Harvard, right? And they're all like, oh, Reiki. Yeah, I love Reiki. And so... So I wanted to go back. That's so it. encouraging to hear. Yeah. So the best schools are more open to it. It's a part of integrative medicine now. It's one of Reiki is one of many modalities that can support health and well-being for patients. So it's being used in hospitals. It's being used in um, medical schools and being taught in medical schools. So um, it it will trickle down and shift more and more of the culture, I, I do believe. At the same time, then you have the kind of TikTok thing. I'm not on TikTok, so I'm just going to, I guess, say the TikTok thing. But you, you get a lot of like narcissistic spiritual kind of stuff going on there. It's, there's some very strange things going on there. So you have this kind of um, lay spiritual movement that sometimes is becoming very ungrounded or narcissistic. And then we have like the scientific spiritual sort of movement. And I'm hoping that we can kind of find some grounding in that and balance before it just becomes like a joke potentially. Right. Yeah, I know. I know the exact stuff you mean. It's so disappointing because you're like, no, there really is valid research about all of this. And yeah. Yeah. it doesn't make any of this look very serious no no yeah. so just gotta brush it off and keep trying to do the balanced work and yeah are, are there any like you mentioned there's some good scientific research of reiki and biofield healing so i guess actually can you just tell everyone what biofield healing is and then i'd love to hear about the research of both reiki and biofield healing some of it that you think is really amazing sure um Biofield is a term which means the fields that emanate off of our body. So they can be electromagnetic, maybe they are. So um, ultraviolet, infrared, um, our heart, our you know all the electrical activity that goes on on our skin, all this kind of stuff creates this system of electromagnetic fields and maybe other maybe quantum fields as well. Um, so all of that 
and the information that's a part of it is called the biofield. And so Reiki is um, termed a biofield therapy. And I think it's the NIH that coined that term in the 90s. But it's also called energy medicine or energy healing, uh, spiritual healing, all kinds of things like that. But in science, we tend to settle on the term biofield therapy. And uh, we call it that. Things are maybe going on with this biofield, but we don't really know um, details so much. Um, we're at the very beginning stages of looking at things like photon emission. So that's an interesting line of research. I think that's really cool seeing how um, photon emission changes when people are practicing Reiki or Qigong um, and what that means. And um, whereas when we look at other fields and how they're changing electromagnetic activity of the hands, for example, we don't see much effects going on. So that's why they call it subtle energy. Um, we haven't quite measured chi yet. And some say we never will measure chi or life force energy because um, one of my colleagues said, open-minded colleagues said, it's in another dimension. You're never going <laughs> to, you won't be able to measure it here. So some say, just don't even try, don't even try. But I think it's fun to, to try and see what these therapies are doing to the physiological systems in the body. So currently we're working on a, a very, very pilot study of, of that biophoton emission um, with energy medicine, it's including Reiki. So some healers will call themselves natural biofield healers. Some are trained in every modality under the sun um, and all of them are used in research to some degree. So some studies um, they're natural healers, and some of them are Reiki masters, and so on and so forth. And we're at the very beginning stages of research, so some of it's messy, and some of it's a lot of it's pilot trials, and um, and of course there are the randomized controlled, placebo controlled studies as well that are out there. And what we see with the Reiki research is that Reiki is absolutely beneficial for things like anxiety, stress, depression, pain, fatigue, nausea. Um, it's really, really helpful for populations that suffer from those symptoms. Um, a lot of people with chronic illnesses, so cancer, for example, all of those symptoms can be helped. And I do mean all of them can be helped by Reiki. And what Reiki does is, at the very least, shifts someone into a parasympathetic state. So that's the opposite of that fight or flight sympathetic state. We're going into the parasympathetic nervous system activation that's that rest, digest. That's what is needed for the body to heal. That's what's needed to reduce inflammation. So it makes sense that if you're shifting into that, that you're going to have all these benefits to health. So at the very least, that's what's going on. You don't have to be post-materialist or even spiritual to believe in that. It's a relaxing practice that helps you heal. So at the very least, that's going on. And then we can look at all the fun stuff like distant Reiki and biophoton emissions and all of that it gets to be a little more interesting <laughs> are there like machines that measure any of this i mean i know you i i, I just don't even know how to ask this because i know it's so <laughs> like amazing and kind of cutting edge but yeah are there machines that have been matching biophoton emissions and any effects of reiki um they're looking so i don't think anyone yet has they're all such pilot studies, I don't think, and I could be wrong, but I don't think anyone has like correlated the emission with symptom improvement, but that definitely is an area that I would love to dig into. But we got lots of research that it improves these symptoms, and then we have a tiny, tiny bit of research that it's altering biophoton emission. The thing is that no two healers are the same. You'll have, maybe you'll have a group of six healers or so, <clears throat> not a big group, but you'll get like four that are really showing differences in these photon emissions. And then you get two that aren't. And does it doesn't always equate to how, quote, powerful they are as a healer. So we really don't know um, what's going on. And meditators show reduced photon emission. So what is the what are the biophoton emissions actually doing? So some say they're a measure of disease or um, lack of health. So they're free radical formation and all this stuff. So we don't really know what's going on clearly with biophoton emission. So is it better if a practitioner doesn't emit the photons, but maybe there's some quantum field process where it's just like 
almost teleporting the light to them for lack of a better term. Like maybe it's not actually emitting from you. It's like within, um, we don't know. It's such an early stage, um, but it's very, very interesting. And um, I think the biophotons is um, the most interesting study of like the biofield as it relates to these, well, biofield practices. So much more work to be done there. And there are, yeah, there are these photomultiplier tubes and they detect like single photons, which is pretty cool because the change is, can be really minor. It can be like just a few photons. So <laughs> you want to be very sensitive equipment. Yeah. And are there any experiments you've worked on that you're just amazed by or a favorite experiment or two you want to share? Well, not with the biofield work. So that's very much around symptom improvement, my work, um, and a bit of, you know, these um, imaging projects. But um, work I did at in the Ellen Langer lab, if you've ever heard of Ellen Langer, um, she studied mindfulness at Harvard um, in the psychology department. And we did some really cool studies with um, time perception as one line of research where um, we published this just a couple years ago. I don't remember the exact date, but it was a sleep study. So we had people in the sleep lab, and this is with NASA sleep scientists um, at Harvard. And you had them come in and they slept and they had trick clocks. So some of the clocks went fast, faster than objective time, and some of them went slower than objective time. And so the people slept maybe eight hours and they thought they slept five hours or they slept five hours and they thought they slept eight hours. And then they did all kinds of tests like reaction time, cognitive tests, looked at their EEG, their self-reported sleepiness and all of this. And we found that their reaction time, their cognitive function, how sleepy they were and their EEG activity all followed perceived time. So if they thought they only slept five hours, but they slept eight hours, you'd think they'd well rested, but they're doing these tasks as if they're sleep deprived just thinking that they slept five hours. Um, so that's a really cool study. And we did, I was involved loosely with the other work that also looked at that with blood sugar levels. So diabetics in the lab, they're playing a video game, we have a trick clock, and then we check their glucose level. And their glucose level, which follows a circadian rhythm throughout the day, followed their perceived time, not the objective time. So experiments like that, where what is the extent of the power of the mind? if we can even change the circadian rhythm in our body or our perceived time in our body, um, which we like to think of as something that's objective. So those are really cool. And some nocebo studies, so opposite of placebo. So um, you're told that something's gonna harm you, for example. So that would be like a false diagnostic paradigm. So we told people, um, they came in the lab and we took a saliva sample and we had them fill out some questionnaires and then the next day we told them, we analyzed your saliva sample and you're developing a cold. Um, sorry, but we want you to stay in the study and we're going to you know, keep, keep you in. Um, and then we looked at their immune function. We looked at their cold symptomology. We looked at if we asked them if they actually got a cold. And a third of them that were told that they were developing a cold actually said, I got a cold. Like, what are you talking about? I had a cold. <laughs> and then their immune function followed. Um, it, it could be a stress response. You know, they're told they're getting a cold. Oh, so all their immune function kind of drops and we can see that in the data. And that's a really, that was a really cool study too. So um, the power of the mind over the body. Wow. And so they weren't, they didn't honestly have any blood work showing they were getting a cold. They were just told it and then they right, got yeah, the cold. Yeah. <laughs> that's so fascinating. And that really ties into like, I'm sure the placebo yeah. research and, you know, I mean, it really, really makes it's you the opposite. Think. Yeah, but it's hard to do those studies because, like, we didn't get ethics approval to do it a second time. We're like, oh, let's replicate this. No, 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 because you, it's too powerful and it's not ethical. Like, what are what's the imp impact of a false diagnosis of cancer on somebody or false diagnosis of anything? Um, the only other one I've seen is a false diagnosis of um, lactose intolerance where the person ended up at, like, or the group of people ended up actually reacting to milk products when they weren't actually lactose intolerant. So that's like an allergy. So we don't know the extent of, of a false diagnosis on, on our health, but we sure should. 
<laughs> we should keep that in mind in medicine. Yeah. Right. I mean, hopefully it's not too common, but it definitely does happen, you know? Yeah. Like can, that whole, yeah. 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 Like because the, a lot of diagnosis is subjective. You got a cluster of symptoms, you know, not everything has a clear lab test. Right. Yeah. And I guess we all like to think everything does. And <laughs> I mean, maybe it happens Do false diagnoses happen more than we realize. I don't know. I've, I've, I think they happen a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And then, I mean, it, you know, when you think of mental health, which of course, cluster of symptoms, and we give a term to, there's no blood test for depression, for example, those kinds of diagnoses can be damaging for the rest of the person's life. Even if in that moment, yes, they did qualify based on these symptoms for depression, major depressive disorder, for example, that label, as I'm sure a lot of people have thought before, that label is going to keep you more likely to stay depressed. So that's kind of along the same lines of like holding on to these labels and diagnoses that maybe we can shift out of easier than we might realize. I heard the weirdest thing once, and I don't know if you've heard of this, but someone, I believe they were, they had multiple personality disorder and one of their personalities had an allergy to nuts and the other didn't and not just in their head like literally yeah. if they were given a nut in one personality it was they had physiological reactions and it was dangerous and when they were the other they could eat the same nut the same body have you heard of any yes. of yes yeah and i love that work that is so interesting and it's absolutely true and allergies are one of those things that's so close to the psychological aspect because your body is attacking something that's not a threat it's not a threat right and so it's very easy to like think something's a threat and then have this dissociated aspect of yourself that doesn't think it's a threat. And so the, it's such a strong split in the self, in the psyche, that the body just follows it completely. Um, very, very, very cool. Or ones that need glasses and others don't and they go for an eye exam. And, you know, it's, it's I guess that's something you could kind of fake maybe, but very, very cool, very cool stuff. Oh, I didn't know the I one. I've got to look more into this. That is so insane and so amazing. Yeah, and, very interesting stuff. And and so let's say you met like a multi-billionaire who was like, you can do any study in the world. What would be your dream study? <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, there's so many and I can't pick one. Um, I think just because of a, along the lines of what we've been thinking, I would like to do like a large scale. So a lot of them are pilot studies with this um, because, you know, more funding, more subjects. So infinite funding, thousands of patients looking at maybe with cancer, um, since it's such a, an issue, obviously. So I would like to look at Reiki, a placebo controlled trial of Reiki or any exceptional healer, really, or healy, healers um, compared to placebo and compared to like usual care, maybe. So at least three groups. And then I would like to look at actual disease outcomes because a lot of the times we're just looking at symptoms. Symptoms matter, of course, for quality of life. So let's look at all the symptoms and then let's look at the disease outcomes as well. We're kind of afraid to touch that in some of these studies because that's complementary therapy, but we're not depriving them of their usual care so they can go have their chemo or whatever they want. So it's like usual care plus Reiki compared to usual care plus sham Reiki compared to usual care. <laughs> And then I would like to look at all this, uh, these biofield measures. I'd like to look at um, biophoton emission. I'd like to and, and try to maybe correlate that to outcomes. Uh, I think that would be really, really cool. I'm also interested in the how these, apart from just like the, the fields and all of that, but the characteristics of the healer, like what makes healing more effective for some healers and others. So I'd like to look at things like um, their level of compassion, their level to tune in and focus and these kinds of things that I think are really important for the effect of Reiki. So a really big study, probably with cancer patients, looking at the symptoms, looking at disease outcomes, and then trying to relate that to these biofield measures would be pretty cool. But I also really love distance, distance Reiki. I think that's extra cool. You add in the whole non-locality aspect, <laughs> what's going on there. So a large scale distance Reiki study would be um, with the same kind of idea would be cool. So that could be another group comparing the distance Reiki to the in-person. 
Not four groups. <laughs> Do you find distance Reiki works as well as in person? I find it's different. Um, How so? Very, very, very different. Um, so I find for me, I don't know about my clients because I'm not taking measures of my clients, which, you know, it'd be nice to know. But <laughs> from my perspective, so I have an in-person practice and I have a distance practice and they're very, very different. When I'm in person, it's a, it's a nice meditation. I'm feeling maybe I'm getting really hot. Maybe I, I can feel in my hands um, hot and cold spots on their body. And um, and that's pretty much it. Like I, I pick up some information and I'm just kind of the energy sort of just flowing and making sure they're comfortable. I'm kind of, you know, I'm very much still in a physical space. I'm and then maybe I pick up a few things. And then my distance session, I'm like, I'm not outward. I'm not moving around my room. I'm not, I don't use a doll or a mannequin or anything like that. It's very much inward and very much of like kind of cupping them in my hands. Very much just sending them love, hearts, you know, in my hands and not moving. I'm just kind of sitting here and lots of information comes and it's, it ends up being like a reading. Um, whereas in person, it's not so much like that. There's a bit of information, but when it's distance, it's a lot of information. And I really don't know why that is, but it's very interesting to me that it's almost like, am I doing the same practice? Is this even the same thing? Because it'll end up being like a mediumship, like someone's past loved one will show up or certain animal spirits and it ends up being very shamanic sometimes. And um, it's a totally different thing. Um, and even more so sometimes if like I used to do it before zoom, right? I, the traditional way of a distance session is okay. This time you go lie down, I'll do the thing. And then I'm going to write it up to you and you know, we'll go from there and ask questions back and forth, but there's no contact during it. But now it's like zoom, everyone wants to be on zoom. So there is a bit more of like, I'm kind of sending maybe through the camera, but, <laughs> but, it, but I'm not. Um, so there's a little bit of a less potency there sometimes with that aspect. But um, yeah, if they're completely off camera and I'm just inward, a lot more information, which is more benefit for the client? I don't know. I'd like to know more. I'd like to know what, what is helping them more. Um, some Reiki boards like um, the Canadian Reiki Association, I don't sign up to be on them because one of their stipulations is that you can't give psychic information. You can't give any information to the client. Well, often they come to me because they want that information. <laughs> a lot of people come to me like something's going on. I'm having a shift. I don't know what's going on. Can you like see what you pick up and let me know? And um, if I didn't have that, I would I'd feel like I'm doing half a job. So I don't, I haven't joined the Canadian Reiki Association, probably won't because <laughs> I can't provide that extra amount. And of course I don't give information they don't want, you know, I'm, it's like, do you want to know? Sure. Okay. No one has ever said, no, don't tell me anything. Um, so, but I think there seems to be some distinction between Reiki and then this like intuitive information, but every Reiki person I know picks up stuff. So yeah. Is, wait, I didn't know you also got psychic and medium information while doing it. And you get more when it's distant, you said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. And, and it might not be true for everybody. Um, I'm an introvert. I don't know if that matters. I don't know. <laughs> but maybe I'm a little more nervous in person. Um, I really don't know. But um, yeah, that was something that was very surprising when I trained in Reiki. Um, when all of a sudden... I saw things or I felt things or um, for me, I'll feel people's emotions. I'll um, maybe get an image of something um, or just know things or just, yeah, it's messages uh, like words, things like that. It's, you know, multi-sensory information comes in. And I, I was very surprised about that. Like the first distance session I did for a client so I worked a lot with family and friends to start, as they say, you know, get some practice in. And I saw the effects in them. I saw on the table, you know, the emotions coming up for them or the pain relief happening. And But when I did my first distance session, um, that blew my mind because 
you learn these symbols in Reiki. It's part of the training. And I was tracing this symbol on her head, on her forehead, for whatever reason. I don't remember, you know, why I was doing that specific thing. But afterwards, she was like, I felt you were tracing this symbol on my forehead. Like it, and, and the woman didn't know Reiki. Right. She didn't know symbols were part of it. She was like, it was like a line that went this way and then that way and down. And she like described. And, I was like, and this was distant or it was in person, but her eyes were closed. No, it was distant. She, I was in Canada and no she was in America. Way. So that to me was like, wow, something's really, this is really cool. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, that's crazy. I love that. And what was, are there any other like evidential verified weird things that happened that you can share our most like client privacy? Yeah, client privacy. Um, but in general, just picking up there's things that, yeah, I don't want to, I guess, break any confidentiality, but um, you pick up things, you know, about their body, about their mental health and about people that have passed about even dreams and aspirations of theirs. Um, uh, seeing an image of uh, I'm trying to not like reveal it, seeing an image of what they want for their life. And then saying, you know, I see, I see you here in this location doing this. And they're like, oh, that's my dream. Like, you know, and, but getting like this clear multi-sensory experience of it where like I'm there, I can, I, I see the sights of, you know, and, oh, yeah, then you should definitely go there. Well, if you want, but, you know, that's the message. Like, um, so really tuning into so much aspects of the person, not just like physical, mental, but like, yeah, their hopes and dreams and, and what would be the right step for them. And they're, it's all really related, I think, to like their soul growth. And, and then some of the dark stuff, like the traumas that, and some of the, pathological thinking that might have brought them to where they are right now and um there's always some kind of like homework or some kind of task or something for them to do to make a shift um very infrequent do they come like with some issue and then there's no guidance right we want to be able to guide them so that they don't need to have the reiki and you mentioned since you were a kid without even trying, which I'm so jealous of, you went out of body all the time, or I don't know if all the time, not but you time. had, a, not all the time, but you had out of body experiences. You had, I, I forget what other experiences you, I guess, a knowing you said and like psychic what? dreams or intuitive dreams a lot. Um, yeah. And then just like a, a, a feeling uh, like home was somewhere else and I'm here on a short trip and I got some kind of purpose. Now as a caveat, my home life was kind of like a rough childhood, you know, some abuse. And so that, that naturally causes, well, a lot of people to question, to think, and um, to some people to a pathological degree and, you can pathologize maybe you want, but it really made me like, it's like, okay, this is crap. <laughs> so <laughs> there's something greater. There's something better. And I feel it, being alone in my room, I didn't feel alone. You know, I felt like there was this, I was still connected to wherever I came from um, sort of feeling. It's hard to explain, but, and uh, just having that kind of communication constantly. I, I was raised... I was put into Catholic school, but I was not raised like Catholic really. But um, my my schools were very liberal in that it wasn't like, you know, dogmatic. It was just like Jesus taught forgiveness and love. And that was kind of the, the gist of it. So I, ha I did have a basis of like belief in a God from a young age, whether that was, you know, inherent in me or because of being raised that way. I don't know, but it was never associated with the way that you would think of being raised in a Catholic way. So I, I, I kind of rejected the Catholicism, but took the, took the good messages from it. Hey everyone. I'm really excited to let you know about the science and spirituality salons I'm now hosting. During these intimate events, a scientifically verified psychic medium will give all of you readings 
and I will give a talk on the science and evidence that changed my mind about an afterlife. This will also be an amazing opportunity to get to meet some of you in person or virtually and to share more about all the science and data that transformed my worldview and got me through my worst days. These can be hosted in your home, in a nearby cafe with a private room, or they can even be virtual. I've hosted a few already, and they were really special. Fascinating, emotional, evidential. So if you're interested in getting a small group together over dinner, brunch, drinks, coffee, to learn more about the science and to get evidential medium readings, send me an email at hello at wtfjusthappened.net and put science and spirituality in the title. Um, and so of those experiences that you used to have, you mentioned, I guess, you where you had a dream of your mom bringing two things of grapes and she got two things of grapes. And did you have any out of body verified or really amazing experiences that you want to share too? Verified. Um, or if not verified, just well, what any standout ones. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I had, uh, yeah, I can't verify any of them, but just like, I didn't want to go to bed, you know, I would want to stay up. So I would just, pop out and kind of go down the stairs and see what was going on. I mean, it didn't happen a lot, but it happened enough. You know, you have one of those, you're like, whoa, because you're fully conscious. It's not like you're asleep, right? And everything is pretty vivid. And um, and then when I was a teen, I started, this is before a teen, and then as a teen, I started to want to have them elicited, like intentionally. So I remember um, having a few where I was very much aware, like floating above my body and and I would get scared, like I'd go up to the to the roof, and then I'd feel like some energies or something. I'd be like, no, and I'd try to go back down. And, and just learning how like when you, you can't move the way you would move your body. And if you try to do that, like, you're trying to move your body and you're, you get paralysis. So that sleep paralysis thing that I don't know if you've ever had, very scary and uncomfortable when you can't move anymore. And, but you're like out of body. And then there are some scary imagery and stuff that can happen with that. I've had a few clients lately that have had sleep paralysis issues. And um, so it's kind of common. But I remember seeing, like I was trying to get up, but I like kicked my leg, but it was my astral leg or whatever you want to call it. It wasn't my physical leg and it was all silvery. And I was like, whoa, it was really cool. Um, but yeah, none of that can be verified, but I was fully awake and fully like, holy gosh, my that's not my <laughs> physical leg. It's just, and then I also remember having just more recently and there it's, it's not like very cool or anything like that, but just, I remember like sleeping on the couch maybe a few years ago and having an out of body experience and seeing what my husband was scrolling. He was looking for like a backpack or something. He was like on Amazon or something scrolling. And I, and I remember seeing it, but I was asleep, like looking, seeing what he was doing in the, and then waking up and were you just looking at that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of verified, but it's not, you know, not super, super cool. But seeing things that were verified, yeah. Those little things, you know, <laughs> like the, knowing the grapes or seeing what your husband was scrolling. I mean, I think sometimes those more than some amazing spiritual are more powerful or I mean, power, maybe powerful in a different way, because they're just so factual. They right. just really back up that our consciousness is more than our brain, which to me at the end of the day is the most remarkable thing you could even begin to imagine. <laughs> so if you just get these little quote unquote normal things, which so much of this stuff just seems to be so kind of mundane which to me right. is the power yeah. of it uh, to me yeah so mundane I kind right of love that yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah mundane I found in the beginning when I was having these dreams um I thought that it was kind of just getting me used to it with things that weren't emotional or things that weren't scary it was just like two bunches of grapes another one I had which was funny we went um we went to this hotel. We used to go to this beach when I was a kid every year with some friends, um, my parents and their parents and kids, and we would rent like a hotel and, and I slept in a bit and I, in my dream, um, I was like swimming in cornflakes. It was like corn, you know, the cereal cornflakes, just little flakes of corn. 
And I was like, isn't there anything else? They're like, no, just cornflakes. And I'm like, what the heck? I wake up, I go to where the breakfast is served. They have these little cereal boxes and all there is is cornflakes. I'm like, is that all there is? <laughs> yep, we ate all the other cereal. There's just cornflakes. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so just I, like, what's the point of that? But I don't know. It's You just get to, it helps you trust your intuition, I guess. It's like. Yeah, maybe that's it. Or maybe there's no point. Maybe it's just if this is how our consciousness works, this is just how our brains get information and you know dimensions are different than we think in our mind and time is different and if this is just how it works then that's how it works you know and I guess to me I I find that so powerful because that just would mean survival works and all these amazing things are just really normal instead of these fantastical right concepts and I it's love that. Point. Yeah, it's a good yeah. point. It, you know, it's like the the past life thing. People will always say, oh, they're, they're always a queen or a king or whatever in a past life. Well, that's not true. But that's, you know, I've heard people say that a lot in, in yeah. you know, in um, trying to debunk the idea of past life memories. It's like everyone thinks they're Cleopatra. It's like, well, no, they don't. But OK, no. maybe in movies. You know? Right. And when you read the actual verified cases, the people have normal lives. I mean, maybe some were successful and some were less successful, but just in ordinary ways. You know, I have yet to have heard this fantastical like I was the queen. I mean, yes, somebody had to be the queen, but I have yeah. yet to hear a case like that. You know? Right. Exactly, because you've actually looked at the cases. So, um, yeah, so that, yeah, it, it is just mundane is a good way of thinking about it. It's just how how nature works. It's how <laughs> reality works, and it doesn't have to be fantastical. And that, to me, makes it seem so powerful. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's the, like, amazement of it to me. Um, and do you have any, like, amazing or just ordinary healing stories that you've done while doing Reiki. I really think, yeah, it's, it's just generally speaking, I think in terms of healing, helping people with chronic issues, for sure. Um, I have yet to, well, I've ex- like, I haven't cured anyone of anything, you know, like, healing is so much different than curing and it's a huge um multi-dimensional sort of process than just you know removing a disease or whatever but it certainly have helped people with chronic illness um with their relieving their symptoms and extending life as well um there was one client it's a it's a testimonial so i feel like i can share the story of the client who um wasn't supposed to be alive for much longer and um I gave him a session and his uh, deceased wife showed up and it was, that was a very powerful thing because I saw her clearly. I didn't, you know, know anything about her. I saw what she looked like, you know, short blonde hair. Her name started with a D and I got all this information and she was kind of like, I'm taking care of him. Like I had to, I had to sort of explain that I was there for, you know, good purpose and okay. Yeah. He's your husband, your person, but I'm just here to help, you know, in any way that I can. Um, but he did end up living a lot longer than because he was he was on his um, I think that he had a few weeks to live and then he lived uh, quite a few more months after that. So and his spirits were lifted and you know his symptoms were improved things like that. Um, I'm not convinced that we're not supposed to die. So one person once said like if Reiki's real, then why aren't all the Reiki masters like 300 years old? Why don't they live forever? <laughs> but I don't think we're supposed to be here forever. <laughs> and you start reading about near death experiences. I mean, dying doesn't seem like a horrible thing after a while. You know, like it actually, it just, it, I mean, everyone dies. It's part of the plan and it doesn't, I mean, yes, before I thought there was an afterlife, I was like, Oh my God, I never want to die. That would just wipe me out. But once you start really studying oh, this, yeah. you're just like, yeah, I mean, it's just yeah. like, you're supposed to eventually go to college. You're supposed to then graduate college. You're supposed to go through different stages. And it just seems like other states of consciousness. And like you'd be missing yes. out on the next things if you never died, you know? It's true. And my mother, who who passed away in 2020, was oh, the most. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, she was, well, she was amazing. My best friend. Totally into all this stuff for sure. And 
I felt like everything I did came down to this moment of she was in the hospital on her deathbed. I hate that term, but whatever. Um, and her family was there, my uncles and her mother and all that. And one of her brothers said, aren't you scared? And she said, no, because of everything Nat taught me. And I was like, oh, my God. That made everything worth it. And not only that, but she was just like, I'm so excited to see Granny and to see this person. And, that. and she was just like, she died in the best way possible, despite it being cancer and pain and all of that. But in her mind, her mindset, her spirit, she was like excited. And she, you know, she saw she had images, a tunnel and all this kind of stuff. She had sort of a near death experience while she was still um, alive. And yeah, pretty remarkable that what all of this can do for a person, because I think I think that was one of my main driving factors early on was to relieve suffering, to remind people who they really are um, so that we can live better and die better. Well, so that was like totally worth everything. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing that. That must have been, I mean, that sounds like a very kind of special, transformative, difficult, yeah. story. So thank oh, you yeah. for being open with that. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. I, I'm just, if it helps other people, then that's good, right? I just felt like that's why I've been doing everything in this moment mm -hmm. right here to, to make her transition better. Oh, such a gift. Right. Yeah. And then to be able to share that with other people, give them hope there's something more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you yeah. said she had an NDE and then she came back before yeah, finally she, passing. She kept kind of thinking she was going. And then um, my dog showed up who passed a few months before that. And she was like, oh, and then she was like, oh, I can't go yet. Oh, it's closing. <laughs> it was just like a little visit. And then, yeah. Um, so she had little moments like that. And she's like, when the color turns this color, then I can go. But it's not turning that color. I think she said when it turns blue or something and so she she was kind of describing what was going on it was pretty interesting yes she was on pain medication at the time but still <laughs> I mean that is still so consistent with so many people towards the end whether they're on medications or not there's or just not. these certain yes. consistencies no yes. matter what you know yes exactly yeah yeah um now I know you mentioned, for example, on Ben's podcast, Unraveling the Universe, that you had a channeling experience and you had a past life regression. Are you comfortable sharing both of those experiences? Yeah, sure. More so the past life than the channeling thing, I guess, but I'm happy to talk about either. Okay. Yeah. If, if you're comfortable, I'd love sure, to yeah. hear a bit about both. Um, yeah, sure. So the past life... Um, I went to uh, an event with my mom <laughs> um, and it was, there was a bunch of people in the room. It was a Hay House event back way back in the day. Um, and Brian Weiss was giving a workshop. And if I'm, you're probably familiar with Brian Weiss, if you're in, digging into the past life stuff. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so maybe just tell our listeners, they might not be. Yeah. He's so. a psychiatrist um, who used to not be into any of this and through psychotherapy and doing some hypnosis work, he uh, started to, understand that some people had past life potential past life influence influencing their current psychology so past life trauma things like that and if you went through it um, in a psychotherapeutic setting that you could um, help current psychological issues so he had different case studies and he's written a book a few books one of them's many lives many masters so I went to one of his workshops and part of that was him talking about his story and then having us do a, a group past life regression and so you go and lay on he's like go lay on the floor or something like that and he took us through his journey and you could probably find hypnosis cds of it or cds <laughs> mp3s whatever um of his of his guided hypnosis and um so i found myself uh he said some of it's symbolic maybe some of it, maybe it's not even real at all maybe like you know he he prefaced it by saying this could be a real past life this could be just symbolic this could be you know just go with it, right? So I'm like, okay, fine, go with it. And I found myself in a town. And I was like, it's like France, but it's Germany. Is it France? Is it Germany? I don't know. I didn't know anything about 
at that time, I didn't really know anything about the history of Germany or France. And so they say, okay, go walk around and talk to people. No one wanted to talk to me. I was kind of like shunned or something. Um, and then he guided me to everybody to the point of death. And I'm, I mean, yeah, here comes kind of a stereotypical situation where I'm up on the, the gallows in the, in the city market square and being executed. Small town, being executed for being a heretic. And I was a man. You look down on your hands as part of it, hairy hands. Okay, I'm a guy. Um, someone threw a rock at my head, like right when I was up there. And then I see this executioner, but it, it's stereotypic. Okay, they're in like a cloak kind of thing. They have this long handle with a little axe at the end. Um, and I get my head cut off. <laughs> didn't feel the pain or anything like that. Floating above, didn't want to leave my family at the time. So I kind of hovered a bit and um, took off. And the whole idea was that I was like resisting some kind of religious movement. I was like, yeah, seen as a heretic. If I was a female, it would have been a witch, that kind of thing. This is where it's kind of stereotypic. But I was just like a normal person. I wasn't anyone special. I was just in the town and I spoke out a lot like I am right now. <laughs> I don't hold back. I just say what I think. And that's what I did. And I got killed for it. And then I was like, okay, I came out crying. It was very emotional for me for some reason. Spoke with my mom about it a bit. And I was like, oh, I feel like everybody hates me. And she's like, I know you've always felt that way. Like, for whatever reason, I just baseline is like, everyone hates me. They're talking about me in a room. They're like deciding my fate, this kind of weird thing that I had with my whole life. And then that went away. And it was like, it was quite a big difference in how I, it kind of opened me up to speak more, maybe. Um, I don't care what people think, that kind of thing. Like it, it released something for me and whether that was symbolic or not, I didn't know. And I let it go for like 10 years. And then it was about 10 years. And then I had a trip for a conference to Germany and I was like, oh, I'm gonna look at, I'm gonna rent a car and I'm, I'd love to drive around Germany and find like, I love finding cute little towns that are, especially in Europe, old, cute little towns. So I'm like looking it up and I come up ac across Rothenburg and I'm like, oh, Rothenburg, like, and I'm just like, all of a sudden I'm like, I think this is the town. Like, I think this is where this happened. Like, I just felt it. And then I go there, part of my little journey. It's outside of Nuremberg and we know Nuremberg, you know, it's, it's Bavaria, Germany. And I go there and I just like know where to go. And I'm, I, I'm like, oh, it was over here. I turned down this little alley. I knew that like, when I go down this alley, it's going to open up into the square and it happened here and I knew which buildings, there were new buildings of course, cause, oh, and at the time I should say during the regression, it kept saying in my head, 1550, 1550, 1550. I don't know anything about that time in Germany, not at all. Um, and never looked up anything after that. I just <laughs> like, um, but then I go there, I'm like, oh my God. And I just, I'm getting all these emotions, like all kinds of emotions, like, I don't know, like anger, but like happiness to be there and like, and just seem to know exactly where to go. And then lo and behold, they have this criminal museum, torture museum or something they call it. And I go in there and there's this big like case of like the executioner's outfit and like this big long handled ax. And then, <laughs> yeah. And then they have these books about the history of what, and all the beheadings they did in that square. And they, there were a couple men that were called heretics back then. And they, and then, you know, they did some witches, they did some heretics and it was around, it started in 14, 1545. So from 1545 to 1560 or something. And I, mine was like 1550. They were doing that in that center. I had no idea of it. Um, and there were a few other, I went to a little church there. I was like, oh, this church, like, I remember this church. And it, it was erected, at, you know, in 1400s. And so there was a lot of just like feelings of the remembrance there. But then going to that museum and being able to see all the things that I saw in that experience. And I had no idea that. And the whole French thing is at that time it was occupied by France. So it's it, that's why I was like, is it Germany or is it France? So you had like English for German, you know, you had all the different occupations going on and, and France was part of that area and so that was it was really really cool to have that all confirmed there's tons of other details I'm sure I'm forgetting because I was just like soaking it all up and 
going through all their texts and stuff, but um, pretty cool. <laughs> um, so, and then in Germany, when you saw that, was it like, did it feel different? Did you feel like memories coming back in some way? Did it have like a personal, emotional feel to it? Yeah, it did. It, it, yeah, it felt very emotional. And I felt a sense of pride at one point because I made it back. I was like, huh, <laughs> here I am. And I was like, maybe I'll open a little spiritual shop there. So, you know, just kind of joking, like, you know, um, it was a lot of emotions and I love the town. And there was a part of me that wanted to move there, you know, oh, maybe I can move here. But obviously I didn't, <laughs> but I'd love to go back. It's, it's a beautiful space. It's a beautiful place. And it taught me a lot about Germany too, where, you know, we obviously have the negative view, a lot of us, the negative view of Germany's recent history, but there's tons of history there and it's a beautiful place. Um, so it gave me more of a, an appreciation for that part of the world as well. And yeah, that's, that's just so amazing that you even ended up there in that town, <laughs> in that place. I mean, what are the odds really? You know, maybe one thing if you like, remembered being in New York or London or like a place that people frequently go or, you know, Berlin, but it's just this small town and that museum. That's kind of amazing in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I'm, a, I do have a logical mind too. So part of me, even telling the story, I'm like, Oh, maybe it's all, maybe it's all not true, but it really was pretty powerful. And there was a lot of confirmed validations there. So, um, I mean, yeah, you yeah. have to question, of course, it's, it's not proof, but it's a really, what I call the interesting anecdotal stories that seem a little more than, you know, not literally, but the I was Cleopatra types, you know, or where, you know, you have, I just think about the emotions. I think it's something worth considering, worthy of serious consideration, I guess, is yeah. the perfect line. Yeah. yeah. And you had a channeling experience, if you don't mind sharing yeah, that. I did. Um, so that was, yeah, a while ago, too. And, you know, I don't, I've had these experiences. I've had the out of body experiences. I've had the channeling experiences. And I don't actively, maybe I'm just busy with work. I don't actively try to do any more of it. So this was like a spontaneous um, channeling where I was on my laptop. I don't know. I was on YouTube or something. And then there was this like, voice but it was inside my head <laughs> voice in my head that was like close the computer it's like interfering with the signal I was like oh okay and I shut the computer and then I felt like there was a presence so it was it's interesting it's like channeling but also maybe just a communication I don't know um same thing I guess because it felt like a, it was like an external presence in the room or multiple presences and um I uh, you know I was kind of nervous like who is this kind of thing and I asked if if it was of the light and I said that on Ben's podcast too and as I said that I thought it was the silliest thing to say like what does that even mean like are you of the light and then I just laughed because the impression I got back was like benevolence right like that's what I'm asking like are you benevolent being and it was so obviously a yes that I, I just laughed at myself when I asked it um and I asked um who you are. So this has been a while now, like, who are you? And they, they explained that, and it was a few of them, they explained that they were um, from beta Aries. They were beta Aryan. And I'm like, beta Aries. Okay. Like, I don't know what that is. I know the Aries is a constellation and that they are um, part of a galactic healing center. And I was like, okay, like we work when people forget um, about the light or, um, when they're in darkness for so long, they can come here and like, remember, it's like a place of remembering and healing. And there's all different galactic races there. And they're all kind of standing. And I'm like, okay, and I'm just writing all this down. Like, that's interesting. And, but the thing that really got me was that my dog was reacting, like completely. So where I felt like they were, so you, I mean, people, a lot of people know when there's a presence, you can feel something like, so you can just sort of feel like there's some, there's something there, there's some beings there. And my dog, um, who'd never done this before, was like looking at it, like, you know, when the hackle comes up, like, what the heck, like growling, kind of like, like, what is going on? And she was, she's a very sweet dog. And she was 
very much like cautious, like what is this? And definitely looking at something like sniffing. Like, <laughs> so I asked, I was like, why is, why is my dog reacting? Oh, well, she sees the energy. She just doesn't understand. Like she sees us, but she has no idea what. So she's like cautious and she's, cause I was like, oh, she's not reacting well. <laughs> But it was really her reaction to this just space where I was feeling this that really made me think that something was actually going on. And then after I looked up Beta Aries and it's one of the stars in the Aries constellation, I didn't realize that. I'm like, oh, okay, they're named like Alpha Beta, you know, um, also known as Sheridan. That's the name of it. It's part of the horn of Aries. So that was pretty cool. And, and they're a healing group where like, do they come try to heal people on earth who've been like lost or is it people like they'd work with you so you can better heal your clients or is it just like after you've passed like you know beings who've had incredibly traumatic lives here or maybe other material planets will go there to repair that's the impression i got was that that's mostly what it is um but i also people after like, passing yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. yeah yeah we're talking like multiple lives of like a trajectory of like darkness mm -hmm. kind of thing where like mm -hmm. you can't um, pass over as smoothly. You need some kind of healing of mm -hmm. some sort. That was the impression I got. I, whether I can work with them probably, cause mm -hmm. why did they contact me to begin with? And then right. I kept, I kept asking like, how can I contact you? They're like, just do it. Like just, do it. and maybe, maybe they're kind of like, oh, she never did. <laughs> cause I never really, I don't know. I never, pursued it maybe I should maybe I should look into that more and then they said that it's like a because there's no space time or t you know time is not the way we think it is that it's almost like a recording so like if I ever do tune right in it's like just right back at the same spot hard to kind of explain it's like you just go right back to where we were just communicating that's kind of the impression. Almost like, like a Zoom recording, you know, yeah. <laughs> like your podcast, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, consciousness can create that and, um, you know, create co our normal consciousness creates podcasts and then someone else can go listen whenever they yeah. want, wherever <laughs> they left it. So it's got to be some, I don't know. I mean, we can't really understand this stuff or can't really yeah. understand other forms of time. But yeah, and maybe they do help me. I don't know. Um I just, I just ran the Center for Reiki Research Conference this past weekend, and one of our speakers was Helen A. Wabe. If you've heard of Helen A. Wabe, now that we're talking about channeling, she does some work with channeling. Yeah, yeah. Um, and she presented a cool study where... We've had, had her on the podcast, actually, oh, before. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, so she was one of our keynote speakers, and um, she presented um, one of their recent studies where they had um, healers. I think they were... Maybe some were Reiki. I don't want to mess it up but he okay biofield healers doing a session and then they had a third person who was a seer a clairvoyant watching the session and then drawing what they saw the energies etc and every single session there were other beings present and in some of them they were extraterrestrial beings so that got me thinking too like maybe they're assisting and i'm not aware of it in the moment i don't know <laughs> but it's pretty interesting how um that, that study is really, really cool. Some really cool work coming out of, of ions. Mm -hmm. They're really, yeah, they're fascinating. <laughs> and I guess um, in all your experiences now doing Reiki and some of your research, what are your thoughts on the afterlife? Have you had experiences, evidence? What would you say makes you, from what I understand, you do think there's an afterlife and what in your experiences makes you think that? Mm -hmm. um, there's obviously lines of evidence that are apart from my own experience. So the children remembering past lives and mediumship and near death experiences and all that. From my experience, um, it would have to be the, the strongest proof um, would be the mediumship experiences that I've had as part of the Reiki practice. So I don't think Reiki in itself really points to that by itself. Um, we can still have energy fields that are affected by our other people's energy. Like you don't have to have an afterlife there, but when you have, when you connect to that other person's energy and all of a sudden 
their past loved one is there and they're giving you these verified messages. You see them clearly. It's verified through photographs. These kinds of things really are quite powerful for the experiencer. If I tell someone that, maybe they'll just think, maybe they'll think I'm crazy, depending on their belief. If they've already looked at cases and they understand as much as you do, then you're more likely to believe my situation. But I don't think it's strong evidence for anyone else. But for me, the multi-sensory aspect of it, the verifications, and not just one instance over and over again, um, to me is um, quite strong evidence. And also um, the distance aspect, because that's kind of cool. It's like, okay, well, our consciousness doesn't depend on space. So that's a big, a big shift there. Um, it's not confined to our brain. That's a big shift. Some animal communication stuff has been pretty cool too, where um, communicating with cats, for example, and doing sessions for cats and really connecting with their consciousness and how similar their consciousness is to us in terms of how it communicates its vibration. And that makes you think there is this maybe one consciousness that we're all a part of. Um, in what ways are cats consciousness similar to ours? And you do a lot of Reiki with cats, I guess you're saying uh, a bit, not, I wouldn't say a lot, mostly humans, okay. but every so often, mm -hmm. Um, someone will contact me to find a lost cat, for example. Um, there's been some really cool stories with lost cats. <laughs> um, and it's there. It's and maybe I who just oh, walked in. No, no. <laughs> He's lying on my feet the whole time. <laughs> oh, perfect. Perfect. Kiwi. Um, yeah. Just the way, they, the way they communicate. Maybe it's, you know, the, the soul, the higher self or whatever whatever it is, but the way that the information comes through from them is very much like you're talking to a human. So, mm -hmm. um, or a guide that's telling you information. Um, and the size of it is weird because it's not spatial, but there is like a power to it. Um, I remember one acquaintance, her cat was sick and I finally got around to like raking, you know, a bunch of people's on Facebook sending energy, da, da, da. I said, okay, I'll send Reiki. I finally got around to connecting with this cat and it was like, whoa, okay. Like right away. I'm like, this is not in a body anymore. Like this is like a celestial, huge being like, and she said, yeah, she passed, you know, an hour ago. So it was like, all I can say is like, it's just a big energy, these cats. Um, and I think that's why they like a lot of space, a lot, almost every cat that I've communicated with is like, I want space. Sometimes when they run away, they just want space. Um, they don't like to be too confined and too, so, <clears throat> and I think it's, their energy is really big. Um, dogs are a little different. Their, their energy is not as big, but their heart is big. It's hard to explain, but it makes me think there's a higher divine intelligence that is, connected to the cat um, that is very similar to the divine intelligence that's connected to us. I mean, the emotional connection I have with both my dog and cat and the connections I see they have with each other are, I mean, they're just as deep as connections with humans, yeah, you know? Yeah, so yeah, for sure. I always, yeah. And I just it's never just understand language people. Issue. It's just a language. That's it. I agree. Yeah. And I would say all animals, you know, I think, humans for some reason have gotten to a mindset that animals don't have you know i don't know the word i don't like the word soul it just has too much religious connotations but don't have like emotions and consciousness maybe personalities the word but yeah right yeah well they definitely do anyone that's owned a pet of any kind you know there's definitely yeah. personality there there's definitely emotion um, um yeah and we're a little over an hour. Do you mind if I ask you just a couple more questions? Sure. Yeah. Have to run. Okay. Did you ever have any luck finding a, anyone's cat? You said you also yeah. find yeah. lost cats. So yes, I don't know if yeah. maybe someone's listening with a lost animal. I know that could oh, be terrifying. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, a few. Uh, one. So one was a long journey where um, she he sorry was lost and um my friend moved to a new location she's like doesn't even know where the house is like he just took off um so it was very concerning because she moved um 
and it was a very strange, long journey. And she wrote a testimonial. So I feel like I can, if they write, if they write their experience publicly on my website or something, I feel like I can talk about it. Um, and this cat didn't have claws. So she was like really worried. And um, I saw that this cat was around the area, but it was being helped by blue jays. It's so strange, right? Okay. Blue jays are helping this cat, like giving it food or something. Very strange. But then my friend kept finding blue jay feathers after that. Like, and I, I'd, and then I was given like exercises. She was like, okay, this cat just wants space. Like give it space. And the cat's talking to me, like, you know, it's been difficult living with her and like telling me things like why it needs this space. Yeah. <laughs> um, so then these instructions like, okay, open your heart, extend it out, like let it know, like you're not smothering it kind of thing. Like, so there was this whole like dance for like two weeks or something like that. And then um, I was like, he knows where the house is. Like these blue jays were helping. I don't, I don't know how this works. I don't get it. But these blue jays, they know where you live. They know where the cat is. They're helping this whole situation. Of course, in shamanic traditions, it'd be blue jay spirit. And there are all these things associated with different energies of animals and animal spirit. And so she kept finding these blue jay feathers. I'm finding blue jay feathers. We're sharing them all. And then one day she's like, oh, he's in the backyard. Like, <laughs> And she got all excited. And then he took off again. I'm like, oh, he's just like playing. And then eventually she's like, he's in my arms purring. And like, you know, so he came home. And it's, it's very clear when they're going to come home and when they're not going to come home. Um, some do not return. So just because like someone contacts me to help bring their cat back doesn't mean they're going to come back. It's not like I can control this being. It's like I can communicate and find out what information's there about it. And sometimes the cat does not want to come back. Maybe they found a better home, mm -hmm. you know, and like, oh, this one has better food or something very simple like that. Um, and sometimes they don't come back, but there have been a few that um, so one that was like stuck somewhere and I saw exactly like they're in this tall grass very close a neighbor's tall grass in this kind of ditch thing and that's exactly where they were and they found the the cat and so it's different information that comes up and, and um, there's there's a free will of the cat of course and it's just a matter of communicating with them and seeing what they need and trying to help bridge that communication with the owner to provide those needs um, or to find them in a, if they're stuck somewhere, of course, and then to go find them. You said it's clear when they're not going to come back. You get messages like, I'm happy you're here. Maybe they came from a family they weren't as aligned with, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe. it's pretty clear. Or when they've passed or okay. there, there was one a long time ago, uh, two of the woman's cats were missing. And I'm like, well, one is definitely coming back and one... I can't find it. Like, it's just not. So one came back, one didn't. Um, hmm. And yeah, I'm. And you were right in which you like knew which one was coming back and which wasn't. Yeah. yeah and well. I don't, I don't charge if they don't come back because I feel like that's what they really want. So like, I'll do the communication. Um, but I'm not, I'm not going to charge money if your cat doesn't return, but some people will pay anyway, because there's been like a lot of work on my behalf of like connecting and all that. But right. um, I, the goal is, you know, to bring the cat back, but they're funny. They're very funny beings. Yeah. They yeah. are funny beings, but I've always felt my cats. I've had a lot in my life and each one I just love so much for themselves. They've all been so attached, Aww. very, very attached. I've always had very close relationships, um, I guess, because I grew up. I mean, I had them since I was very little. Yeah, oh, that's sweet. So I'm going to ask you one last question. I know you're not going to have a real answer for it, so it's a little speculative. Um, as someone who's also studied neuroscience and our logical scientist, too, do you have any idea how non-local consciousness could work? Like, is it a mechanism? <laughs> is it a quantum particle? Like, you know, I don't even know how to ask the question because we don't know enough yet. I but... know, I know. It's and, no, <laughs> and I guess there's a two part to it, too. Do you think the same energies that like work in Reiki and work in some of maybe the parts of you during out of body experiences? Do you think it's all the same substance that holds our non local consciousness when we pass? And yeah, so I guess answer all this the best you can. Obviously, <laughs> it's speculative. Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, these are things that 
you know, I think frequently and yeah, we do not have an answer. Are we ever going to be able to measure it? No idea, but we're going to keep trying. Right. So the best in terms of like non-locality, the, the connection between beings at a distance, we often equate that with quantum entanglement. But we have not demonstrated that at the size of humans. Um, if we have physiological responses, which we do in different locations that match, for example, so if someone's um, thinking of a loved one and, you know, that loved one has a physical reaction, like in, there's, a, there's a signature in their brain or there's a signature in their gut, sometimes the electrical activity of the gut responds. That's pretty interesting. So there is some kind of almost immediate connection between separate beings in their physiology as well as um, psychology. Is it quantum entanglement? Maybe. How does that work in the brain? Don't know. There's been a lot of different theories and nothing really has, nothing has really solidified as like, uh, yeah, as like the main theory. And we don't know how that works. And I'm not a physicist, but if I did get to do another degree, I would definitely do a physics degree because it's super interesting. Um, but I do think like, yeah, the mechanism, some, I feel like the mechanism for in-person Reiki and distance Reiki is different. Um, Interesting. Just because of the experience of it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's multi-level. There's a lot of things going on. Um, so I don't think it's one thing. Um, if the thing that's holding everything together is the same, your second question, what was your second question? If Oh, it was, I, I think you answered the two okay. together. Um, yeah, like what's, what mechanism or substance or quantum particle or how does it mechani mechanistically work our non-local yeah. consciousness yeah. and survival consciousness? And is it the same possible like quantum particle or whatever yeah. mechanism yeah. for Reiki, for survival, for psychic, you know, is it all the same mechanism or totally yeah. different? I mean, I often think of like consciousness as being, you know, fundamental. So it can't be reduced to anything else. So it can't technically be anything physical. It can't be split mm -hmm. apart. It's nothing, um, maybe. <laughs> if consciousness mm -hmm. is like the canvas, the, the, the nothingness, the, the origin, the singularity, the how does that, open question, create then so-called physical reality or waves, right? So there's some kind of like, non-moving infinitely internal nothingness that is somehow creating motion because we have frequency all the waves and the frequencies are different for you know all different electromagnetic spectrum matters slow vibration high vibration all of this how the heck does consciousness create motion that creates all these different frequencies Mystery. Yeah, yes, yes. And how does it store information? Where's all this information stored that's non local consciousness that, you know, you use in Reiki that two particles quantum yeah. entangle fa and communicate yeah. faster than the speed of light? I, I would guess there's some form of similarity and also some differences, you know, just like the way there's differences as we talked about between humans and cats, but a lot's the same. We have brains, we have noses, mouths, you know. Right. Yes. More, more alike than, than different. Um, I think so. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, this, the, where is everything stored or how is it stored? And um, yeah. And how does it imprint on a brain and, you know, yeah. how does it tie into time and, <laughs> And oh, and also all that, it's probably also sort of where, you know, everything that's ever happened, at least in this iteration of our universe is stored in light waves, you know, if you were to travel fast, as fast as speed of light, you would follow everything that looks still because it's all being imprinted in light waves where it travels on. I don't know if eternally, maybe just until the next big crunch, who knows, but at least within this universe, <laughs> maybe multiverse, I don't know. I, I mean, those are bigger, but... I would think somehow it would tie into light and the way light stores like it's information from the beginning of the birth of yes. this universe. Yeah. And, and bang, light I guess. We, we can't perceive with our eyes right. um, or it'd be kind of crazy everywhere probably. <laughs> right. Right. Um, yeah. It's, I mean, it's all very interesting. 
Great. Well, it's been an, almost an hour and a half and I really appreciate you coming on. Um, are there any questions I haven't asked you that you wish I had? Is there anything you want to share that you didn't get to? Um, no, I think, I mean, that was a great, fun conversation. I, it was. You know, I wish I could answer that last question more. And I just, <laughs> I'll just keep scienceing and I'll keep researching and, um, Oh, yeah. Yeah, because it is the ultimate question. And um, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, well, then, yes, I wish I wish one of us could answer it, too. Hopefully one day, probably not in this iteration of our lives, but at some point. Um, where can listeners find you, follow you, stay in touch, learn about your more of your work, book Reiki sessions? Yeah, um, you can go to my website. It's drnatalydyer.com. You can book sessions there. You can email me at uh, natalieleedyer at gmail.com, uh, Lee being my middle name. Uh, you can find the email address on my website. Um, I have a book coming out on, uh, it's called Infinite Perception. It's um, the power of psychedelics for global transformation. That's available for pre-order. It's going to be a pretty cool anthology. I know we didn't really talk about plant medicine, but um, it's about that. And um, yeah, um, you can also follow me on Instagram. It's like at Dr. Natalie Dyer, I believe. And um, yeah. Oh, oh okay. I know. I'm like, I wish we, you have to come back and talk about plant medicine at some point because I don't know much about it yet. And I find it very interesting. Oh, and it seems like yeah, a lot of people that. are talking about it now. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, that'd be cool. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Natalie. I so appreciate your time. Thanks. Great to have, great to connect. Okay. okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye. So, I know all of you listening or all of you who've read my books have heard me talk about the Forever Family Foundation and the founders, Fran and Bob Ginsburg, who are almost like adopted parents to me. And they were absolutely instrumental in helping me in my early grief and helping me get evidence they have a grief retreat that I want to tell all of you about. It is January 17th through 19th in Fort Myers, Florida. And they have their certified mediums who have passed science-based testing to assure they get accurate information and specific information. You know, they can't say... You know, you lost a great grandma who loves you. They have to get very accurate and specific information using science-based testing to be certified. And, oh my God, they have been instrumental, these mediums, in changing my mind about afterlife. They're so evidence-based. Also, they always have really interesting speakers at this one, Sonia Rinaldi. Will be there. And I don't know if you know about her work at all, but she does this crazy, like, I don't even know what, like using electronics to have our loved ones communicate through them and send images. It's so what the fuck. It, I love her work. And there's just going to be amazing people. The guests bond so much and some become lifelong friends. I've met friends who were other guests there too that I still talk to and I'll be there so if you come please come say hi to me and you can go to their website foreverfamilyfoundation.org if you want to attend one of these grief retreats to get more information on what the fuck just happened go to wtfjusthappened.net there, you can order my book, WTF Just Happened, A Sciency Skeptic Explores Grief, Healing, and Evidence of an Afterlife. You can learn all about how I came to conclude that there most likely is an afterlife, but you can also learn about the early stages of my grief and the amazing, fascinating people I met along the way. You can read about how much I harassed the mediums and scientists trying to get evidence to see if the mediums were cheating and see if what everyone was saying actually was true. You can also subscribe to our newsletter to stay updated on any new developments and any interesting new what the fuck updates. 
So if you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. It makes such a difference, especially for a new podcast like this one. And if any of you have had a crazy what the fuck yourself, have any questions, feedback, or just want to say, hey, reach out on either Instagram at WTF underscore just underscore happened underscore or email me at hello at WTF just happened dot net. I love hearing from all of you. It makes my day hearing your stories and questions and feedback and all of it. And remember, you don't have to draw any final conclusions as you wonder what the fuck just happened. <laughs>